Welcome to Woo English. Learn English through stories using clear and simple sentences. Before we start, we encourage you to leave comments and press the like button to support us. Remember, the purpose of these stories is educational and we do not encourage or glorify the characters. Chapter 1 The Early Years I was born on August 13, 1926, in Biran, a small village in eastern Cuba. My name is Fidel Alejandro Castro Ruz. My father, Angel Castro, came from Spain. He was a wealthy farmer who owned a large sugar plantation. My mother, Lina Ruz, was a servant in my father's household before they married. This was my world, a mix of privilege and hardship and it shaped me in ways I would only understand much later. Our home was large and bustling with activity. My father was always busy with the plantation, managing workers, and ensuring the crops were healthy. He was a stern man, but fair. He believed in hard work and discipline. My mother, on the other hand, was kind and caring. She took care of us children and the house. She had a gentle touch and always knew how to make us feel loved. As a child, I was curious and restless. I wanted to explore everything around me. The plantation was my playground. I watched the workers toil under the hot sun, cutting sugarcane and loading it onto carts. Their faces were worn and tired, but they never complained. I admired their strength and endurance. I often wondered why they had to work so hard while others lived in comfort. School was an adventure for me. I attended a small local school where I learned to read and write. I loved books and stories. They opened up new worlds for me, worlds where anything was possible. My favorite subjects were history and politics. I was fascinated by the stories of great leaders and revolutions. I dreamed of making a difference, of being someone important. My father believed in education, and he sent me to better schools in Santiago de Cuba and later in Havana. These were big cities, full of noise and excitement. I was away from home, but I was eager to learn and make new friends. The schools were different from what I was used to. They were strict and the teachers demanded a lot from us. But I thrived in this environment. I enjoyed the challenge. At the University of Havana, I studied law. This was a turning point in my life. The university was a hotbed of political activity. Students were passionate about their beliefs, and they were not afraid to speak out. I joined the student politics and quickly became a leader. I spoke at rallies organized protests, and wrote articles for the student newspaper. I felt a burning desire to fight against injustice and corruption. The more I learned, the more I saw the inequalities in our society. The government was corrupt, and the people were suffering. The rich got richer, while the poor struggled to survive. This was not the Cuba I wanted to live in. I knew something had to change, and I wanted to be part of that change. One event that deeply affected me was a visit to a poor neighborhood in Havana. The conditions were terrible. Families lived in small, crowded shacks with no running water or electricity. Children played in the dirt, their clothes torn and dirty. I spoke to the people there, and their stories broke my heart. They worked hard, but they could barely afford to eat. This was not right. I knew then that I had to fight for these people, for their right to a better life. My father did not understand my passion for politics. He wanted me to focus on my studies and become a lawyer. But I could not ignore what I saw around me. I argued with him many times about this. He worried that I was getting involved in dangerous activities. He was right to worry. The path I chose was full of risks but I was determined. In 1947, 
I joined an expedition to overthrow the dictator Rafael Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. This was my first taste of revolution. The mission failed, and we had to escape back to Cuba. But this did not discourage me. It only made me more determined. I continued my fight against the government, organizing protests and speaking out against injustice. My life changed forever on July 26, 1953. I led a group of rebels in an attack on the Moncada barracks in Santiago de Cuba. The plan was to start a revolution, but the attack failed and many of my comrades were killed or captured. I was arrested and put on trial. This was a dark time, but it was also a moment of clarity for me. I defended myself in court, delivering a speech that would become famous. I ended with the words, History will absolve me. I was sentenced to 15 years in prison, but I knew that our fight was just beginning. In prison, I had time to think and plan. I wrote letters and articles, spreading our message. After less than two years, I was released as part of a general amnesty. I went into exile in Mexico, where I met the man who would become my close comrade, Che Guevara. Together, we planned our return to Cuba, ready to continue the fight. Looking back, I see how my early years shaped me. The contrast between my privileged upbringing and the suffering of the workers on my father's plantation opened my eyes to the inequalities in our society. My education and involvement in politics gave me the tools to fight for change. And the failure of the Moncada barracks attack taught me the importance of perseverance. These experiences were the foundation of my revolutionary journey, a journey that was only just beginning. Chapter 2 Education and Awakening I grew up in Biran, a small village in eastern Cuba. My early years were full of adventure and curiosity, but as I grew older, my parents decided I needed a better education. They sent me to prestigious schools in Santiago de Cuba and later in Havana. This was the beginning of a new chapter in my life. Santiago de Cuba was much bigger and busier than Biran. The streets were full of people, cars and noise. It was exciting and a little overwhelming at first. The school I attended was strict and demanding. The teachers expected a lot from us. I worked hard and soon stood out because of my intelligence and charisma. I made many friends and became a natural leader among my classmates. In Santiago, I first began to notice the inequalities around me. I saw how some people lived in big houses with plenty of food, while others struggled to survive. This did not seem fair to me. I started to ask questions and think about why things were this way. But it was not until I moved to Havana that my awakening truly began. Havana was even bigger and more bustling than Santiago. The city was full of life and energy. The University of Havana was a place of great learning and excitement. I decided to study law as I wanted to understand the rules that governed our society. I was eager to learn and make a difference. At the university, I met many passionate and intelligent people. The campus was alive with ideas and debates. I quickly became involved in student politics. We organized protests and rallies, speaking out against the injustices we saw. The government was corrupt, and many people suffered because of it. This ignited a burning desire for change within me. One day, while walking through a poor neighborhood in Havana, I saw children playing in the dirt. Their clothes were torn and dirty. Their homes were small, crowded shacks with no running water or electricity. I spoke to some of the families. They told me about their struggles, about how hard they worked and how little they had. This made me very sad and angry. I knew then that I had to do something to help these people. 
My involvement in student politics grew deeper. I gave speeches, organized meetings, and wrote articles for the student newspaper. My voice was strong and clear, and people listened to me. I spoke about the need for justice and equality. I talked about the corruption of the government and the suffering of the poor. I wanted to inspire others to join me in the fight for a better Cuba. My father did not understand my passion for politics. He wanted me to focus on my studies and become a successful lawyer. We argued many times about this. He worried that I was getting involved in dangerous activities. But I could not ignore what I saw around me. I felt a deep responsibility to fight for those who could not fight for themselves. In 1947, I joined an expedition to overthrow the dictator Rafael Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. This was my first taste of revolution. The mission failed, and we had to escape back to Cuba. But this did not discourage me. It only made me more determined. I continued my fight against the government, organizing protests and speaking out against injustice. One of the most important moments in my life happened on July 26, 1953. I led a group of rebels in an attack on the Moncada barracks in Santiago de Cuba. We hoped to start a revolution. The plan failed, and many of my comrades were killed or captured. I was arrested and put on trial. This was a dark time, but it was also a moment of clarity for me. I defended myself in court, delivering a speech that would become famous. I ended with the words, History will absolve me. I was sentenced to 15 years in prison, but I knew that our fight was just beginning. In prison, I had time to think and plan. I wrote letters and articles, spreading our message. After less than two years, I was released as part of a general amnesty. I went into exile in Mexico, where I met the man who would become my close comrade, Che Guevara. Together, we planned our return to Cuba, ready to continue the fight. Looking back, I see how my education and awakening shaped me. The contrast between my privileged upbringing and the suffering of the workers on my father's plantation opened my eyes to the inequalities in our society. My education and involvement in politics gave me the tools to fight for change and the failure of the Moncada barracks attack taught me the importance of perseverance. These experiences were the foundation of my revolutionary journey, a journey that was only just beginning. Chapter 3. The Seeds of Revolution In 1947, I joined an expedition to overthrow the dictator Rafael Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. This mission was dangerous, but it was a cause I believed in deeply. We wanted to bring freedom to the people suffering under Trujillo's harsh rule. We were a small group, full of hope and determination. As we prepared for the journey, I felt a mix of fear and excitement. This was my first real step into the world of revolution. The expedition began with high spirits, but it soon turned into a disaster. Our plans fell apart and we were forced to retreat. Many of my comrades were captured or killed. I barely escaped with my life. This failure was a hard blow, but it did not break my spirit. Instead, it made me more determined. I realized that the fight for justice would be long and difficult, but I was ready for the challenge. Back in Cuba, the situation was getting worse. President Fulgencio Batista ruled with an iron fist. Corruption was everywhere, and the rich grew richer while the poor suffered. I could not stand by and watch my people suffer. I knew I had to continue the fight. I began organizing protests and rallies. We spoke out against the government, demanding change. 
The police often broke up our gatherings, but we did not give up. One night, I was speaking at a rally in Havana. The crowd was large and angry. People were tired of living in poverty and fear. As I spoke, I felt their pain and anger. I told them that we had the power to change our country. I urged them to stand up and fight for their rights. The crowd cheered, and I knew that we were on the right path. We were planting the seeds of revolution. The government saw me as a threat. They tried to silence me, but I would not be silenced. I continued to speak out, writing articles and giving speeches. I knew that words were powerful. They could inspire people to take action. I traveled across the country, meeting with workers, students, and farmers. I listened to their stories and shared my vision for a better Cuba. Many joined our cause, and our movement grew stronger. One of the key moments in our struggle came in 1952. Batista seized power in a military coup. He canceled the elections and declared himself president. This was a clear sign that he would stop at nothing to hold on to power. The people were outraged, and so was I. I knew that we had to take more drastic actions. Protests and speeches were not enough. We needed a plan to overthrow Batista and his corrupt regime. I gathered a group of trusted friends and comrades. We met in secret, planning our next steps. We knew that we needed weapons and training. We also needed a strong base of support. We decided to focus our efforts on the Sierra Maestra Mountains. This remote area would be a perfect place to build our guerrilla army. We began to gather supplies and recruit fighters. The journey to the Sierra Maestra was dangerous. We had to avoid the police and Batista's soldiers. Many times we were nearly caught, but we pressed on, driven by our vision of a free Cuba. In the mountains, we trained hard. We learned how to fight and survive. We also built strong bonds of friendship and trust. We knew that we could rely on each other in the toughest of times. Life in the mountains was harsh. The terrain was rugged and supplies were scarce, but we were determined. We reached out to the local peasants earning their trust and support. They helped us with food and shelter. In return, we promised to fight for their rights. Our numbers grew, and we became a strong, united force. The government tried to crush us, but we fought back. Our hit-and-run tactics confused Batista's soldiers. We struck quickly and then disappeared into the mountains. Each victory, no matter how small, boosted our morale. We knew that we were making progress. Our message spread, and more people joined our cause. One of the most difficult times came when the government launched a major offensive against us. They sent thousands of soldiers to the mountains to destroy us. We were outnumbered and outgunned, but we did not give up. We used our knowledge of the terrain to our advantage, we set traps and ambushes, striking at the enemy and then vanishing into the forest. The battles were fierce, and many of our comrades were killed. But we held our ground. During this time, I often thought about the people we were fighting for. I remembered the poor families in Havana, the workers on my father's plantation, and the children playing in the dirt. They were the reason we were fighting. Their faces gave me strength and courage. I knew that we could not fail them. As the months passed, our movement grew stronger. We gained more supporters and more victories. The government was losing control. Batista's soldiers were demoralized, and the people were rising up. The seeds of revolution that we had planted were beginning to bear fruit. Looking back on those early years, I see how they shaped me. The failures and hardships taught me resilience. The support of the people gave me hope, and the fight against injustice gave me purpose. These experiences were the foundation of my revolutionary journey. 
We were no longer just a small group of rebels. We were a movement, and our dream of a free Cuba was becoming a reality. Chapter 4 The Moncada Barracks Attack On July 26, 1953, we were ready to make a bold move. I led a group of 160 rebels in an attack on the Moncada Barracks in Santiago de Cuba. Our plan was ambitious. We wanted to strike a blow against the oppressive government of Fulgencio Batista. We believed that this attack would inspire others to join our cause. It was a risky plan, but we were determined. We arrived in Santiago de Cuba in the early morning. The city was quiet and most people were still asleep. We divided into groups and approached the barracks from different directions. My heart was pounding. I knew the risks, but I also knew that this was our chance to make a difference. As we got closer, we encountered the first obstacle. A group of soldiers was patrolling the area. We had to move quickly. Shots were fired and chaos erupted. The element of surprise was lost. We fought bravely, but the soldiers were well prepared and heavily armed. The battle was fierce and brutal. Many of our comrades were killed or wounded. Inside the barracks, the situation was even worse. We faced more soldiers, and the fighting became intense. I could see the fear and determination in the eyes of my comrades. We pushed forward, but it was clear that the attack was not going as planned. The soldiers were too many, and their defences were too strong. Despite our best efforts, we were being overwhelmed. I realised that we had to retreat. The dream of a quick victory was shattered. We needed to save as many lives as possible. I gave the order to fall back. It was a painful decision. We had come so far, and now we were forced to abandon our mission. As we retreated, many of us were captured. The soldiers showed no mercy. They beat and arrested us, dragging us to their headquarters. In the aftermath of the attack, I was taken to a cell. My body ached from the wounds and the beatings, but my spirit was unbroken. I knew that we had to keep fighting, even if this battle was lost. I spent the next few days in solitary confinement, thinking about what had gone wrong and how we could continue our struggle. My trial came quickly. The courtroom was filled with soldiers, officials and spectators. They wanted to make an example of me. I was charged with leading the attack and causing the deaths of many people. They wanted to silence me, to crush our movement. But I refused to be silenced. When it was my turn to speak, I stood up and faced the judges. I knew that this was my chance to make our message heard. I spoke about the injustices that had driven us to take action. I talked about the suffering of the Cuban people under Batista's regime. I explained why we had attacked the Moncada barracks and what we hoped to achieve. My words were passionate and heartfelt. I wanted everyone to understand that we were fighting for a just cause. I ended my speech with the words that would become famous, History will absolve me. I believed in these words with all my heart. I knew that in time, people would see that we were on the right side of history. The courtroom was silent as I finished speaking. The judges did not show any sympathy. They sentenced me to fifteen years in prison. But I left the courtroom with my head held high. I knew that our fight was far from over. Prison was a harsh and lonely place. The days were long and the conditions were terrible. But I used my time wisely. I read and studied, learning everything I could about history, politics and revolution. I wrote letters and articles, spreading our message to the outside world. I stayed in touch with my comrades, planning our next steps. I refused to let the prison break my spirit. During my time in prison, 
I thought often about the attack on the Moncada barracks. I thought about the bravery of my comrades and the sacrifices they had made. I thought about the families who had lost loved ones. It was a painful memory, but it also strengthened my resolve. I knew that we had to keep fighting, that we could not let their sacrifices be in vain. After less than two years, I was released as part of a general amnesty. The government hoped that this would calm the unrest, but it only made us more determined. I went into exile in Mexico, where I met the man who would become my close comrade, Che Guevara. Together, we planned our return to Cuba, ready to continue the fight. Looking back on the attack on the Moncada barracks, I see it as a turning point in our struggle. It was a painful and costly lesson, but it also showed us the strength and determination we needed to succeed. It was the seed that would grow into a full-fledged revolution. Our fight was just beginning, and we were ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. The spirit of July 26th would live on, driving us forward in our quest for a free and just Cuba. Chapter 5. Exile and Preparation After serving less than two years in prison, I was released as part of a general amnesty. The government hoped this would calm the unrest, but it only made us more determined. I knew our fight for a free Cuba was far from over. I left for Mexico, seeking safety and the chance to regroup. Mexico was a new world. The bustling streets, vibrant colours and lively markets were different from the darkness of prison. I felt a sense of freedom but also urgency. We needed to continue our struggle. In Mexico City, I met a group of exiled Cubans. We shared stories and plans. We were all united by the same goal, to overthrow Batista. One day, I was introduced to a young Argentine doctor named Ernesto Che Guevara. Che was passionate and intelligent. He had traveled through Latin America and seen the suffering of the people. His experiences had made him a revolutionary. We talked for hours about our dreams for a better world. I knew immediately that he was someone I could trust. We decided to join forces. Che and I began planning a guerrilla war. We knew it would be difficult, but we were ready to face any challenge. We gathered a small group of fighters, men who were brave and committed to our cause. We trained in secret, learning how to fight and survive in harsh conditions. Each day we became stronger and more united. We needed a way to return to Cuba. We found an old yacht named Grandma. It was small and worn, but it would carry us to our homeland. On November 25, 1956, we set sail from the Mexican coast. The journey was long and dangerous. The sea was rough, and many of us were seasick, but our spirits were high. We sang songs and shared stories, dreaming of the day we would see Cuba again. After seven days at sea, we finally spotted the Cuban coast. It was a moment of great joy and relief, but our happiness was short-lived. We landed in a swampy area far from our planned location. We were exhausted and disoriented. Soon, we were ambushed by Batista's soldiers. The attack was fierce, and many of our comrades were killed. The rest of us scattered into the mountains. The Sierra Maestra Mountains became our refuge. Life in the mountains was hard. The terrain was rugged, and food was scarce. But we were determined to survive and continue our fight. We set up camps and trained in guerrilla warfare. We reached out to the local peasants, earning their trust and support. They helped us with food and shelter. In return, we promised to fight for their rights. Che became my close comrade and advisor. He was a brilliant strategist and a fearless fighter. Together, we planned our attacks on Batista's forces. 
we used hit-and-run tactics, striking quickly and then disappearing into the mountains. Each victory, no matter how small, boosted our morale. Our numbers grew as more people joined our cause. We became a strong, united force. One of our first major victories came at the town of La Plata. We ambushed a convoy of Batista's soldiers, capturing weapons and supplies. This victory showed the people that we were capable of defeating the enemy. It also gave us much-needed resources to continue our fight. The news of our success spread, inspiring others to support us. Our movement grew stronger every day. We gained more supporters and more victories. The government was losing control. Batista's soldiers were demoralized, and the people were rising up. The seeds of revolution that we had planted were beginning to bear fruit. We knew that the road ahead would be long and difficult, but we were ready to face any challenge. Looking back on those early days in Mexico and the mountains, I see how they shaped our revolution. The hardships and failures taught us resilience, the support of the people gave us hope, and the fight against injustice gave us purpose. These experiences were the foundation of our revolutionary journey. We were no longer just a small group of rebels. We were a movement, and our dream of a free Cuba was becoming a reality. Each day in the mountains was a test of our resolve. We faced hunger, illness, and constant danger but we also experienced moments of great camaraderie and inspiration. We sang songs around the campfire, shared stories of our lives, and dreamed of the future. These moments gave us strength and reminded us why we were fighting. One of the most difficult times came when Batista launched a major offensive against us. Thousands of soldiers were sent to the mountains to destroy us. We were outnumbered and outgunned, but we used our knowledge of the terrain to our advantage. We set traps and ambushes, striking at the enemy and then vanishing into the forest. The battles were fierce, and many of our comrades were killed, but we held our ground. During this time, I often thought about the people we were fighting for. I remembered the poor families in Havana, the workers on my father's plantation, and the children playing in the dirt. They were the reason we were fighting. Their faces gave me strength and courage. I knew that we could not fail them. As the months passed, our movement grew stronger. We gained more supporters and more victories. The government was losing control. Batista's soldiers were demoralized, and the people were rising up. The seeds of revolution that we had planted were beginning to bear fruit. Our fight was just beginning, and we were ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. The spirit of our struggle would live on, driving us forward in our quest for a free and just Cuba. Chapter 6. The Sierra Maestra Campaign The landing in Cuba was a disaster. We had hoped for a triumphant return, but instead we faced immediate danger. Most of our comrades were killed or captured. Only a few of us survived. Among the survivors were my brother Raul, Che Guevara, and myself. We fled into the Sierra Maestra Mountains, seeking refuge and a new beginning. The Sierra Maestra was a harsh and rugged place. The mountains were covered in dense forest, and the terrain was difficult to navigate but it was also a perfect hiding place. We set up camp and began to regroup. We knew that we needed to build a strong guerrilla force if we were going to continue our fight against Batista. Our first priority was survival. We had little food and few supplies. The local peasants, however, came to our aid. They shared their meager provisions with us and provided us with shelter. In return, we promised to fight for their rights and freedom. Slowly, 
we gained their trust and support. Life in the mountains was hard. We faced hunger, illness and constant danger from Batista's soldiers, but we were determined. We trained every day, learning how to fight and survive in the harsh conditions. Che Guevara, with his medical knowledge and military skills, became a key figure in our group. He treated the sick and wounded and helped train our fighters. We used hit-and-run tactics to strike at Batista's forces. We would attack quickly and then disappear into the mountains. These tactics were effective. They confused and demoralized the enemy. Each successful raid boosted our morale and strengthened our resolve. Propaganda was another important part of our strategy. We needed to win the hearts and minds of the Cuban people. We wrote articles and pamphlets, explaining our cause and our vision for a free Cuba. We smuggled these writings out of the mountains and into the cities and villages. Our message spread, and more people began to support us. One of our key victories came at the town of La Plata. We ambushed a convoy of Batista's soldiers, capturing weapons and supplies. This victory showed the people that we were capable of defeating the enemy. It also gave us much-needed resources to continue our fight. The news of our success spread, inspiring others to join our cause. As our movement grew, so did the challenges. Batista launched several offensives to destroy us. Thousands of soldiers were sent into the mountains. The battles were fierce, and many of our comrades were killed. But we used our knowledge of the terrain to our advantage. We set traps and ambushes, striking at the enemy and then vanishing into the forest. Each battle was a test of our resolve, but we held our ground. During these difficult times, I often thought about the people we were fighting for. I remembered the poor families in Havana, the workers on my father's plantation, and the children playing in the dirt. They were the reason we were fighting. Their faces gave me strength and courage. I knew that we could not fail them. The support of the local peasants was crucial to our survival. They provided us with food, shelter, and information about enemy movements. In return, we helped them with their daily struggles. We built schools and clinics, and we taught them how to read and write. These efforts strengthened our bond with the people and solidified their support for our cause. Che Guevara became my close comrade and advisor. He was a brilliant strategist and a fearless fighter. Together, we planned our attacks on Batista's forces. We used hit-and-run tactics, striking quickly and then disappearing into the mountains. Each victory, no matter how small, boosted our morale. Our numbers grew as more people joined our cause. We became a strong, united force. As the months passed, our movement grew stronger. We gained more supporters and more victories. The government was losing control. Batista's soldiers were demoralized and the people were rising up. The seeds of revolution that we had planted were beginning to bear fruit. Our fight was just beginning and we were ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. The spirit of our struggle would live on, driving us forward in our quest for a free and just Cuba. Each day in the mountains was a test of our resolve. We faced hunger, illness, and constant danger. But we also experienced moments of great camaraderie and inspiration. We sang songs around the campfire, shared stories of our lives, and dreamed of the future. These moments gave us strength and reminded us why we were fighting. One of the most difficult times came when Batista launched a major offensive against us. Thousands of soldiers were sent to the mountains to destroy us. We were outnumbered and outgunned. But we used our knowledge of the terrain to our advantage. We set traps and ambushes, striking at the enemy and then vanishing into the forest. The battles were fierce, and many of our comrades were killed. 
but we held our ground. During this time I often thought about the people we were fighting for. I remembered the poor families in Havana, the workers on my father's plantation, and the children playing in the dirt. They were the reason we were fighting. Their faces gave me strength and courage. I knew that we could not fail them. As the months passed, our movement grew stronger. We gained more supporters and more victories. The government was losing control. Batista's soldiers were demoralized, and the people were rising up. The seeds of revolution that we had planted were beginning to bear fruit. Our fight was just beginning, and we were ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. The spirit of our struggle would live on, driving us forward in our quest for a free and just Cuba. Chapter 7. Victory and Challenges January 1st, 1959, was a day I will never forget. After years of struggle, Batista fled Cuba. Our forces marched triumphantly into Havana. The streets were filled with cheering crowds. The people were celebrating the end of a brutal dictatorship. I felt a mix of joy and responsibility. Our fight had brought us to this moment, but now the real work began. We faced enormous challenges. Cuba was in ruins. The economy was shattered. There was widespread poverty and inequality. We had to rebuild from the ground up. Our first task was to restore order. We set up a provisional government and began to address the most urgent needs of the people. Food, water and medical supplies were distributed to those in need. One of our main goals was to institute land reforms. The vast majority of the land was owned by a few wealthy families. This was not fair. We wanted to give land to the peasants who worked on it. We believed that this would not only improve their lives, but also boost the economy. We faced resistance from the landowners, but we pushed forward with our plans. We also had to deal with opposition from within and outside Cuba. Some people did not agree with our revolutionary ideals. They feared change and clung to the old ways. We tried to engage them in dialogue, but many were resistant. We had to find a balance between maintaining order and allowing for dissent. One of the first major steps we took was to nationalize industries. We believed that the wealth of the nation should be used to benefit all its people, not just a few. We took control of the major industries, including sugar, oil, and telecommunications. This was a bold move, and it brought us into conflict with powerful interests, especially in the United States. Implementing socialist policies was another key part of our plan. We wanted to ensure that everyone had access to education, health care, and housing. We invested heavily in building schools, hospitals, and affordable housing. These efforts began to show results, but there was still much work to be done. One of our biggest challenges was the economy. Years of corruption and mismanagement had left it in a dire state. We worked tirelessly to stabilize it. We sought help from other countries, including the Soviet Union, to provide the resources and expertise we needed. Slowly, we began to see progress. Industries were revived and jobs were created. Throughout this time, I remained deeply involved in the day-to-day -day running of the country. I wanted to ensure that our vision for a fair and just society was realized. I met with workers, farmers and students, listening to their concerns and ideas. Their energy and determination inspired me to keep pushing forward. Education was a cornerstone of our new society. We believed that an educated population was essential for a strong and prosperous nation. We launched a massive literacy campaign, sending teachers into the most remote areas of the country. 
the results were remarkable. Within a few years, illiteracy rates dropped dramatically. Healthcare was another priority. We built new hospitals and clinics, ensuring that everyone had access to quality medical care. We trained thousands of new doctors and nurses, many of whom came from humble backgrounds. The improvements in healthcare were evident, with lower infant mortality rates and increased life expectancy. Despite our successes, we faced ongoing challenges. The United States imposed a trade embargo on Cuba, trying to isolate us economically. This made it difficult to obtain the goods and resources we needed, but we were resourceful. We found new trading partners and developed our own industries to become more self-sufficient. We also had to deal with attempts to overthrow our government. There were numerous plots and attacks, both from within and outside Cuba. We strengthened our security forces and took measures to protect our leaders and institutions. It was a constant struggle, but we remained vigilant. In the midst of these challenges, we continued to promote our revolutionary ideals. We supported liberation movements in other countries, believing that the fight for justice and equality was a global one. This brought us both allies and enemies on the international stage. As the years went by, I saw the changes we had brought to Cuba. The lives of ordinary people had improved significantly. There was a sense of hope and pride in our nation. But I also knew that our work was far from finished. We had to keep pushing forward, overcoming obstacles and striving for a better future. Looking back on those early days of victory and challenges, I am proud of what we achieved. We faced enormous difficulties, but we never gave up. We built a new society based on principles of justice, equality, and solidarity. The road was long and often difficult, but the spirit of the revolution remained strong. We had transformed Cuba, and our journey continued. Chapter 8 The Bay of Pigs Invasion In April 1961, we faced one of the most dangerous challenges since the revolution. The U.S. government backed an invasion by Cuban exiles at the Bay of Pigs. They wanted to overthrow our government and take back control of Cuba. The invaders landed on the southern coast, hoping to find support among the people. But they were mistaken. The invasion began early in the morning. We received reports of enemy forces landing on our beaches. I knew this was a critical moment. We had to act quickly and decisively. I gathered my commanders and gave the order to mobilize our forces. We had to repel the invaders and defend our revolution. The fighting was intense. Our soldiers, many of whom were young and inexperienced, faced a well-armed enemy. But they fought with courage and determination. They knew what was at stake. We could not let our enemies take back our country. The battle raged on for three days. The invaders tried to advance, but our forces held their ground. We used everything we had, tanks, artillery, and aircraft. Our pilots flew low over the beaches, strafing the enemy positions. Our infantry advanced through the dense jungle, pushing the invaders back. The Cuban people also played a crucial role. Local fishermen and farmers took up arms to defend their land. Their bravery was inspiring. On the third day, the tide turned in our favor. We launched a final assault on the enemy positions. Our soldiers moved forward with determination, breaking through the invaders' defenses. The enemy was trapped. They had no choice but to surrender. We captured hundreds of prisoners and seized their weapons and equipment. The victory at the Bay of Pigs was a turning point for us. It strengthened our position and showed the world that we could defend our revolution. It also sent a clear message to the United States. We would not be defeated. 
But the invasion had deeper consequences. It pushed us closer to the Soviet Union. We needed allies who would support us in our struggle against U.S. aggression. The days following the invasion were filled with tension. We knew that the United States would not give up easily. They had invested a lot in the failed invasion and would likely try again. We had to prepare for the worst. I met with my advisers to discuss our next steps. We decided to strengthen our defenses and seek support from the Soviet Union. I traveled to Moscow to meet with Soviet leaders. I explained our situation and asked for their help. They agreed to provide us with military aid, including weapons and advisers. This was a significant step. It marked the beginning of a close alliance between Cuba and the Soviet Union. We knew that this alliance would provoke the United States, but we had no other choice. Back in Cuba, we began to build our defenses. We constructed bunkers and fortified positions along the coast. We also trained our soldiers and prepared the people for the possibility of another invasion. The atmosphere was tense, but there was also a sense of determination. We had faced great challenges before, and we were ready to face them again. The Bay of Pigs invasion also had a profound impact on me personally. It reinforced my belief in the strength and resilience of the Cuban people. I saw firsthand the courage and determination of our soldiers and civilians. Their bravery inspired me and gave me hope for the future. I knew that as long as we stood together, we could overcome any challenge. As the months passed, the tension between Cuba and the United States grew. The failed invasion had humiliated the U.S. government, and they were determined to bring us down. They imposed a trade embargo, hoping to isolate us economically. But we found ways to survive. We traded with other countries and developed our own industries. The support from the Soviet Union was crucial. They provided us with much-needed resources and technical expertise. We began to modernize our military and improve our infrastructure. Our relationship with the Soviet Union grew stronger, and we became a key player in the Cold War. The Bay of Pigs invasion was a catalyst for change. It marked the beginning of decades of tension between Cuba and the United States. But it also strengthened our resolve and united us in our fight for independence. We knew that the road ahead would be difficult, but we were ready to face any challenge. Looking back on those days, I am proud of what we accomplished. The victory at the Bay of Pigs showed the world that we were a force to be reckoned with. It also taught us valuable lessons about resilience and determination. We had faced a powerful enemy and emerged victorious. The spirit of the revolution remained strong and our journey continued. Each day, I worked tirelessly to ensure that our revolution would succeed. I met with workers, soldiers and students, listening to their concerns and ideas. Their energy and commitment inspired me to keep pushing forward. We faced many challenges, but we never lost sight of our goal, a free and just Cuba. The Bay of Pigs invasion was a defining moment in our history. It tested our strength and resolve, but it also brought us closer together. We had proven that we could defend our revolution against all odds. As we moved forward, we carried with us the lessons learned from that battle. The fight for justice and equality continued, and we were ready for whatever lay ahead. Chapter 9 The Cuban Missile Crisis In October 1962, the world stood on the edge of a catastrophe. The Cuban Missile Crisis was the most dangerous moment in our fight for independence. It all began when the Soviet Union placed nuclear missiles in Cuba. This decision put us at the center of a tense standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union. 
We agreed to the missiles because we needed a strong defense against future invasions. The memory of the Bay of Pigs was still fresh in our minds. We could not afford another attack. The missiles were our insurance, a way to protect our revolution and our people. But the stakes were high. We knew that this move would provoke a strong reaction from the United States. In October, American spy planes discovered the missiles. The reaction was immediate and severe. President Kennedy demanded their removal and imposed a naval blockade around Cuba. The world watched as the tension between the two superpowers escalated. We were caught in the middle, facing the possibility of a nuclear war. The days that followed were filled with fear and uncertainty. The United States threatened to invade if the missiles were not removed. The Soviet Union stood by us, refusing to back down. The world held its breath, waiting to see what would happen next. It was a time of great pressure and intense negotiations. I played a crucial role during this crisis. I stood firm in our decision to defend Cuba. I knew that showing weakness could invite another invasion, but I also knew that we had to find a peaceful solution. I communicated with both the Soviet and American leaders, trying to navigate this dangerous situation. The pressure was immense, but I remained focused on our goal, to protect Cuba and avoid a nuclear war. The tension reached its peak on October 27th. Both sides were preparing for the worst. The threat of war loomed over us, but behind the scenes, negotiations were taking place. The Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev, and President Kennedy were searching for a way out of the crisis. The world watched and waited, hoping for a peaceful resolution. Finally, on October 28th, an agreement was reached. The Soviet Union agreed to remove the missiles from Cuba. In exchange, the United States pledged not to invade our country. It was a relief to know that the immediate danger had passed. The missiles were dismantled and shipped back to the Soviet Union. The blockade was lifted and the threat of war receded. The Cuban Missile Crisis taught us many lessons. It showed us the importance of standing firm in the face of pressure. It also demonstrated the value of diplomacy and negotiation. We had faced the brink of nuclear war and emerged with our independence intact. But the crisis also left a lasting impact. The tension between Cuba and the United States continued, shaping our future relations. In the aftermath of the crisis, we focused on rebuilding and strengthening our country. We continued to work with the Soviet Union, developing our economy and military. But we also knew that we had to be vigilant. The threat of invasion was still real. We could not afford to let our guard down. The Cuban people showed incredible resilience during this time. Despite the fear and uncertainty, they remained strong and united. They supported our government and our decisions. Their courage and determination inspired me to keep fighting for our revolution. We had faced great challenges and emerged stronger. Looking back on the Cuban Missile Crisis, I am proud of how we handled it. We stood firm in our principles and protected our country. We showed the world that Cuba could not be bullied or intimidated. The crisis also strengthened our resolve to continue our fight for justice and equality. We knew that the road ahead would be difficult, but we were ready to face any challenge. The Cuban Missile Crisis was a turning point in our history. It tested our strength and resolve, but it also brought us closer together. We had proven that we could defend our revolution against all odds.
As we moved forward, we carried with us the lessons learned from that crisis. The fight for justice and equality continued, and we were ready for whatever lay ahead. In the years that followed, we continued to build our nation. We invested in education, healthcare, and infrastructure. We worked to improve the lives of our people, ensuring that everyone had access to the basic necessities. We faced many challenges, but we never lost sight of our goal, a free and just Cuba. The Cuban Missile Crisis was a defining moment in our journey. It showed us the power of unity and determination. It reminded us of the importance of standing up for what we believe in. As I reflect on those days, I am filled with pride and gratitude. We faced one of the greatest threats in our history and emerged victorious. Our revolution was strong and our future was bright. The spirit of the Cuban people remained unbroken and our journey continued. Chapter 10 Exporting Revolution Throughout the 1960s and 1970s, our revolution was not confined to Cuba. I believed that the struggle for justice and equality should extend beyond our borders. We supported revolutionary movements around the world. Our goal was to spread socialism and help other nations achieve their own freedom. Cuba's role in these international efforts began to grow. We sent aid and support to various countries, particularly in Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean. We provided military training, medical assistance and educational programs. Our commitment to these causes brought both admiration and condemnation. Some saw us as champions of the oppressed, while others viewed us as troublemakers. One of our first major international efforts was in Algeria. In 1961, the Algerian people were fighting for independence from French colonial rule. We provided them with weapons, training and medical aid. I felt a strong connection to their struggle seeing it as similar to our own fight against Batista. The victory of the Algerian people in 1962 was a significant moment. It reinforced my belief in the power of solidarity and revolution. Our involvement in Africa continued with the Congo. After the assassination of Patrice Lumumba, the country fell into chaos. We sent Cuban fighters, led by Che Guevara, to support the revolutionary forces. The mission was challenging, and ultimately, it did not succeed. However, it was a valuable experience. It showed us the complexities of international struggles and the need for local leadership and support. One of our most significant contributions was in Angola. In 1975, Angola was fighting for independence from Portuguese colonial rule. The conflict quickly turned into a civil war, with various factions vying for power. The United States and South Africa supported one side, while the Soviet Union and Cuba supported the other. We sent thousands of Cuban troops to Angola, providing crucial support to the revolutionary forces. The Battle of Quito Cuanavale in 1988 was a turning point in the Angolan conflict. Our troops fought alongside Angolan forces, holding off a major South African offensive. The victory was significant. It helped secure Angola's independence and also contributed to the eventual downfall of apartheid in South Africa. This moment was a source of great pride for us. It showed the impact of our commitment to international solidarity. In Latin America, we supported various revolutionary movements. In Nicaragua, we provided support to the Sandinista National Liberation Front. They were fighting to overthrow the Somoza dictatorship. In 1979, they succeeded, and Nicaragua embarked on its own path of socialist transformation. Our support was instrumental in their victory 
and it strengthened our ties with other revolutionary governments in the region. Our involvement in the Caribbean was also significant. We supported the government of Maurice Bishop in Grenada. Bishop was a Marxist-Leninist leader who aimed to implement socialist policies. We provided medical, educational and military assistance. Unfortunately, in 1983, a coup led to Bishop's assassination. The United States then invaded Grenada, reversing many of the gains made by the revolution. These international efforts were not without controversy. Many countries, especially the United States, criticized our actions. They accused us of interfering in the internal affairs of other nations and spreading communism. We faced economic sanctions and diplomatic isolation, but we remained steadfast in our beliefs. We saw our actions as a continuation of our revolutionary struggle, a way to help others achieve the same freedom we had fought for in Cuba. Our internationalism also brought admiration. Many people around the world saw us as a beacon of hope. They admired our courage and commitment to social justice. Our medical missions in particular were highly praised. Cuban doctors and nurses traveled to remote areas, providing much-needed health care. These efforts saved countless lives and showed the world a different side of our revolution. Throughout these years, I remained deeply involved in our international efforts. I met with leaders from around the world, discussing strategies and sharing experiences. I visited countries in Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean, offering support and solidarity. These experiences broadened my understanding of the global struggle for justice and deepened my commitment to our revolutionary ideals. Looking back, I am proud of what we accomplished. We stood in solidarity with oppressed people around the world, helping them in their struggles for freedom. Our efforts in Africa Latin America and the Caribbean had a lasting impact. We showed that a small nation like Cuba could play a significant role on the global stage. Our commitment to internationalism was a testament to our revolutionary spirit. But our international efforts also taught us valuable lessons. We learned the importance of local leadership and the complexities of revolutionary struggles. We faced setbacks and challenges, but we never gave up. Our commitment to solidarity and justice remained strong. We believed that a better world was possible, and we were willing to fight for it. As I reflect on these years, I am filled with a sense of pride and determination. We faced enormous challenges, but we never lost sight of our goal. We supported revolutionary movements around the world, spreading the ideals of socialism and justice. Our journey was far from over, but we had made significant strides. The spirit of the Cuban revolution lived on, inspiring others and driving us forward in our quest for a better world. Chapter 11. The Special Period. In 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union brought an unexpected and severe crisis to Cuba. This period, known as the Special Period, was one of the greatest challenges I faced as a leader. Overnight, we lost our main trading partner and source of economic support. The impact was devastating. Food, fuel and medicine became scarce. The entire island felt the strain. The early days of the special period were marked by uncertainty and fear. Our people, who had grown accustomed to a certain level of stability, suddenly faced shortages in almost every aspect of life. The food rations became smaller and lines at the stores grew longer. Public transportation came to a near halt due to the lack of fuel. Hospitals struggled to provide basic care without enough medicine and supplies. 
I knew that maintaining control and guiding the nation through this crisis would be a monumental task. The morale of the people was low, and there was a real danger of social unrest. I addressed the nation, urging everyone to remain resilient and united. I spoke about the need for sacrifice and innovation. I knew words alone would not solve the problems, but I hoped to inspire a sense of solidarity and determination. We had to find ways to adapt quickly. We turned to agriculture, encouraging urban farming and community gardens. Every available piece of land was used to grow food. The government provided seeds and tools, and people worked together to cultivate crops. These efforts helped alleviate some of the food shortages, but it was not enough. Our transportation system faced similar challenges. With fuel in short supply, we had to come up with alternative solutions. We encouraged the use of bicycles and carpooling. Oxen replaced tractors in the fields, and horse-drawn carriages became a common sight in the cities. These changes were difficult, but they demonstrated the resourcefulness and resilience of our people. Healthcare was another critical area. With limited access to medicine, our doctors and nurses had to find new ways to treat patients. We turned to natural and traditional remedies, using herbs and plants to create medicines. Our medical professionals also focused on preventive care, emphasizing the importance of nutrition and hygiene to keep people healthy. Despite these efforts, the situation remained dire. The economy was in freefall and the black market thrived. People were desperate and the government had to take action to stabilize the economy. I decided to introduce limited market reforms. This was a difficult decision as it went against many of our socialist principles, but it was necessary to prevent total collapse. We allowed small private businesses to operate, giving people the opportunity to earn a living through their own efforts. Farmers markets were established, where people could sell their produce directly to consumers. We also opened the country to tourism, inviting foreigners to visit and spend money in our hotels, restaurants and shops. These measures helped inject much needed cash into the economy. The special period tested the resilience of our nation. It was a time of great hardship, but it also brought out the best in our people. Communities came together to support one another. Families shared what little they had with neighbors. There was a sense of solidarity and mutual aid that kept us going through the darkest days. International support was also crucial. Countries like China and Venezuela stepped in to provide aid. They sent food, fuel and medical supplies, helping to ease the burden. Our solidarity with other nations grew stronger as we navigated this crisis together. The international community saw the strength and determination of the Cuban people. As the years passed, we began to see signs of recovery. The economy started to stabilize and the reforms we had implemented began to bear fruit. People adapted to the new realities, finding innovative ways to survive and thrive. The lessons learned during the special period would shape our future policies and strategies. Looking back, I am proud of how we faced the special period. It was a time of immense challenge but it also highlighted the resilience and ingenuity of our people. We demonstrated that even in the face of extreme adversity, we could find solutions and move forward. The crisis reinforced my belief in the strength of our revolutionary spirit. The special period was a defining moment in our history. It showed us the importance of adaptability and solidarity. We learned to be resourceful and self-reliant, qualities that would serve us well in the years to come. Despite the hardships, we emerged stronger and more united. As I reflect on those challenging years, I am filled with gratitude for the perseverance of the Cuban people. 
Their courage and determination were the backbone of our survival. Together, we faced the crisis head-on and found a way through. The special period was a testament to the power of collective effort and the indomitable spirit of our nation. Chapter 12. Legacy and Retirement In 2008, my health began to decline. It became clear that I could no longer lead the country as I once did. After decades of guiding Cuba through revolutions, crises and transformations, I made the difficult decision to hand over the presidency to my brother Raoul. It was a bittersweet moment. I knew it was necessary, but stepping back from the role I had dedicated my life to was not easy. Raoul was well prepared to take over. He had been by my side through every major event in our revolution. He understood the challenges and shared my vision for Cuba. I felt confident that he would continue our work and protect the gains we had made. The transition was smooth and the people welcomed Raoul as their new leader. Although I was no longer president, I remained deeply involved in the issues that mattered to me. I continued to write and speak about global affairs, sharing my thoughts on the challenges and injustices facing the world. My writings were published in newspapers and magazines, reaching people far beyond our island. I wanted to keep the spirit of the revolution alive and inspire others to fight for justice. During my retirement, I spent a lot of time reflecting on my life and the legacy I would leave behind. I knew that my story was complex and that people would view it in different ways. To some, I was a champion of the oppressed, a leader who stood up against imperialism and fought for equality. To others, I was a dictator who suppressed freedoms and ruled with an iron fist. These conflicting views were part of the reality of my life. I had made difficult decisions, and not everyone agreed with them. But I had always acted out of a deep conviction that I was doing what was best for Cuba. My goal was to create a society where everyone had access to education, healthcare, and the basic necessities of life. I believed that the revolution was the only way to achieve this. As I looked back on the years, I remembered the triumphs and the challenges, the victory over Batista, the struggle during the Bay of Pigs invasion, the tense days of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the support we gave to revolutionary movements around the world, and the resilience we showed during the special period. Each of these moments shaped the course of our nation and defined who we were. In my retirement, I also found joy in simpler things. I spent time with my family, enjoyed the beauty of our island, and reflected on the natural world. I found peace in nature, a stark contrast to the turbulent years of my leadership. These moments of tranquility were a gift, a chance to appreciate the quiet strength of life. On November 25, 2016, I passed away. The news of my death spread quickly, and the world reacted in various ways. In Cuba, people mourn the loss of their leader, reflecting on the impact I had on their lives. Around the world, there were mixed reactions. Some praised my contributions to social justice, while others criticized my methods and policies. My legacy is indeed complex. I am remembered as a symbol of resistance and defiance, someone who challenged the powerful and stood up for the vulnerable. I inspired many to believe in the possibility of change and the power of collective action. But my legacy also includes the controversies and the criticisms, the suppression of dissent, the limitations on personal freedoms, and the economic hardships faced by many Cubans are all part of my story.
Despite the debates and differing opinions, I hope that my life and work will continue to inspire discussion and reflection. I wanted to show that it is possible to dream of a better world, and to fight for that dream, even in the face of great adversity. My journey was one of unwavering conviction and dramatic change. It was a journey that sought to transform society and uplift the oppressed. As the years go by, I hope that people will look at my life with a nuanced perspective. I hope they will see the complexities and understand the motivations behind my actions. My goal was always to create a more just and equitable world, even if the path was fraught with difficulties. In the end, my legacy is a testament to the power of ideals and the impact of one person's determination. I leave behind a Cuba that is proud and resilient, a nation that has faced immense challenges and emerged stronger. My story continues to inspire and provoke debate, reminding us all of the enduring struggle for justice and the importance of standing up for what we believe in. As I rest now, I am at peace, knowing that I gave my all to the cause I believed in. My life was dedicated to the pursuit of a better world, and I am grateful for the journey. The spirit of the Cuban Revolution lives on, and I hope it will continue to inspire future generations.